Father in heaven, I thank you that you are doing a good work in all of us. And we just are amazed at you and the fact that you have invited us to come into your presence and to spend time with you, to quit from our labors of the week so that we can enjoy your fellowship, that you long to be with us. And Lord, you still long for us even though we get busy with ourselves and our things. And we have a hard time, even if we make our hands stop labor, we have a hard time turning off our minds. We have a hard time turning off our hearts and just focusing on you. Lord, forgive us. I thank you that you continue to stretch your arms out towards us. And you continue to beg us to come to you and to taste of your goodness and to see that your promises are sure and our hope can be in you and we won't be put to shame. I thank you, Father, that you tell us of yourself. You tell us in your nature around us, the cycles that never end, the things that are never used up. There's always enough, enough food, enough water, enough sunlight to warm us, clouds to shade us when it gets too hot. There's always enough with you. You are the all-sufficient one, El Shaddai. You comfort us in our sorrows. You rejoice with us when we rejoice. You long to give us the goodness. In fact, you just give us goodness all the time and we walk by unknowing. We don't even recognize that we're so ungrateful. We're so thankless as a people. We don't even see the millions of gifts you give us every day. The things that you long to share with us, we just walk by. We're too busy in ourselves, too busy with our little petty problems. And it's all petty. There isn't a problem we face on earth that will not be fixed in eternity. Amen. It is all Amen. petty. Amen. Oh God, forgive us for not grabbing hold of our inheritance. For not grabbing hold of an eternal vision that you came to give us. You came to give us life and life more abundant. And, and we haven't grabbed hold of that. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our thanklessness. But I thank you that every day your mercies are new. Every morning, every morning you, you call us into a deeper communion walk with you. And our sins of yesterday do not keep us from walking with you today, nor do they hinder us tomorrow. For you are the sufficient one. You are. So Lord, I pray right now that we would be open and honest with you. It'd be just you and us. We would bear our chest. We wouldn't try to look good or save face in front of anybody else. Lord, it's just you and us. Lord, I pray that you would do the surgery that's necessary in our hearts. Father, we want to know you more. Amen. We want to walk closer to you. We need you more than any other time in this, maybe our life. Mm -hmm. All the insecurities and uncertainties in the world uncertainties with health, uncertainties with kids, questions that are unanswered in our lives, hopes and dreams that we're not sure are going to materialize. Mm. Father, I just pray that we would cling to you. We would find that security in you. And that we would begin to look at these difficulties as blessings, moments of grace from you beckoning us to find our sufficiency in you. Thank you, Lord. I pray this all in your precious name, Lord Jesus, the name that is higher above every other name, 
the name before which every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess for you are truly curious you are lord you are adonai over all amen and amen, amen. so mashlom chem start with a little hebrew today mashlom chem Mashlomech, if you're a girl. Mashlomcha, if you're a boy. But since we have a mixed group, we'll be Mashlomchem. All of y'all. All y'all. If you're from the South. All y'all. All y'all. How you doing? Technically speaking, the direct translation is what's your peace? It's a great question. What's your peace? And peace, of course, in Hebrew does not mean like peace out. It means how are you doing whole? Mm -hmm. Are you whole? Is everything about you complete? Are you at rest? It's a pulse on your spirit. Where's your spirit? Are you anxious? Are you afraid? Are you desiring something you don't have and it's driving you? To do and say things that maybe you wouldn't normally do or say? What's your peace? Are you worried? More than any other day, Shabbat should be a day where we ask ourselves, what's my peace? Where's my peace, maybe? You see, when we were created, we were created at rest with our surroundings, in our relationships, and with God. Everything was perfect. There was nothing out of place in our lives. And it was only the entrance of sin that caused us to feel insecure in where we were. Now all of a sudden we weren't sure if we would have the food, clothing, and shelter we needed. We weren't sure that we would be accepted by God or anyone else for that matter. It didn't take too far down the road for us to become afraid of animals and them to become afraid of us and people fighting and killing each other and lechery and adultery and all these other things started to come into our lives and jealousy. And then we always had to try to find a way to make our security sure, to make our peace sure. And so, so many people, including ourselves, have run around trying to find that peace. And there's lots of solutions that the world offers for the peace. Some of them are more acceptable than others. Some find their peace at the bottom of a bottle. Not so acceptable. Some people find it in a night's worth of games. Some people find it gossiping to their friends. Somehow that'll make it better to just talk about it to somebody. Sometimes we find it in ourselves we go round and round and round in an endless conversation with ourselves feeling worse and worse more and more depressed more and more anxiety before we know it we just pull the covers over our head and stay there where's your peace this is a sad state of us as a people broken this is what God came to save us from. He didn't want us to live broken. He wanted to live us to live whole. You see, before in the garden, before there was sin, we were in perfect communion with God. And there was this desire to walk with God. That was the desire. Even Eve as she was getting ready to take from that forbidden fruit. Why? Because she saw it was going to make her wise like God. I wanted to be like God. Wasn't that a good thing? But it wasn't, because that's not what God said to do. And whenever we try to do a good thing the wrong way, it was, doesn't work out for us. It didn't work out for Eve didn't work out for mankind and it still doesn't work out for us today. 
So at the right time, the fullness of time, God sent his son. Hebrews talks about Christ in a way that no other book does. It is the best description of who Christ is. And if you haven't read it recently, I would suggest that you do. Because it's so easy to forget that it's really all about Jesus. And I'll stop here and just make the disclaimer. Uh, over the years, we have used the name Jesus. We have used the name Yeshua. It doesn't matter. It's The name is the essence of the person. Okay? So, I just want to clear that up. The current group of people that we're with tend to feel more comfortable with Jesus, so that's that. <laughs> but we can go either way. Jesus' name is in Greek. Yeshua is in Greek, translated into English. Yeshua means he saves. Yahweh saves. Hallelujah that Yahweh saves. Oh, praise the Lord Amen. that he saves us from our brokenness. Amen. Hallelujah. So just reading from Hebrews uh, chapter 1 and verse 2. I love this. Actually, I'm going to just back up. Throughout our history, God has spoken to our ancestors by his prophets and in many different ways. The revelation he gave them was only a fragment at the time, building one truth upon another. But to us living in these last days, God now speaks to us openly in the language of a son, the appointed heir of everything. For through him, God created the panorama of all things and all time. The sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor. Like, can you get your mind around that? The dazzling radiance of God's splendor. The exact expression of God's true nature. His mirror image. He holds the universe together and he expands it. By the mighty power of his spoken word. He accomplished for us the complete cleansing of our sins. That means he fixed our brokenness. And then took his seat on the highest throne at the right hand of the majestic one. Hebrews goes on to talk about how Christ is preeminent in all things. There are many other places in Paul's writings Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, pick one. They all talk about the preeminence of Christ because he is the preeminent one. It really is all about him. He's heir of everything. All things were created through him. He's the radiance of God's splendor, the expression of God's nature. He holds the universe together. He moves the kingdom plan of God forward. He accomplished the complete cleansings of our sins. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He's greater than the angels by rank and name. His name that he's been given is the name synonymous with Yahweh. There is no lower name for him. It's the exact same one. If you look in the Aramaic text of the New Testament, it becomes very clear. He is Yahweh Adonai. The familiar name of God. In the Greek text, all you get is Kyrios, which could be used of humans, could be used of the divine. He is the favored son. Y'all remember two times. One, when he was baptized, and he, right, he comes out of the waters, and the dove, symbolically, the Holy Spirit, comes upon him, and God speaks over him. This is my son whom I delight in. And then again on the Mount Transfiguration, and, and he's changed into his glory right before Peter, James, and John. And Elijah is there, and Moses is there. And Peter says, oh, let's make tabernacles. And, and God says, this is my son. Listen to him. I delight in him. If God delights in his son so much, shouldn't we? The angels bow and worship him. He rules a forever kingdom. These, by the way, are all coming from Hebrews. If you just read through that first couple of chapters, 
He goes on and on and on. He is unchanging. He is the great I am. Going back to Exodus, when God reveals himself as, who, who shall I say sent me? Moses says to the Israelites. He says, I am that I am has sent you. I am the present one. Do you get that? Like in English, the construction doesn't work. No English teacher will ever let you get away with saying, I am. You are something. That particular sentence form requires a something at the end of it. Only God can say, I am, and stop there. Hallelujah. He is the all-present one, which means he's present in your life right now. Glory. His presence is existent now. He is not far away. Amen. He is now. Amen. He is here. He is present. He is for you. Amen. He was made human. As high as he was, this was a meditation there is brought to me as I was complaining about my ever increasing weight. I just can't, something's amiss in my body. And it's all found its way to my belly. <laughs> it's uh, wherever it's coming from, it's going there. And I was complaining because of the weightiness of all of it. And, and there it said, don't you think Christ suffered with his weight too and i said i never thought of a fat jesus <laughs> <laughs> he said no what was he before he put on human flesh yeah he was a spirit if he was 93 pounds it would have been heavy <laughs> to be bounded by this human frame what a sacrifice to be able to go anywhere you want at any time you want and be in every place he was god he is god to be bound and to live in the constraints of a human frame no. and walk a broken path so that he could experience the bitterness of our life. And that way, when he looks into your eyes and he says, I understand, he really does. He's not putting it on. He really is sympathetic to our weaknesses. He really does know. He knows my broken body. And my pain, and the pain in relationships, and the struggles we have with not knowing how things are going to turn out in the world around us. He knows. He didn't live in this wonderfully peaceful time. He lived and he walked among the Romans who were oppressive, terribly so. They were thieves and liars and stealers and and you could get executed because they didn't like the color of your tunic. He understood. He understands today. He knew the pride of the people. He knew what they had been before. And their desire to go back. They were seeking a revolution. He knew that the religious system didn't have answers. And that they were putting heavy weights on the people. And the people couldn't bear them. And that's why he looked out over the people and he said, they're like sheep that have no shepherd. Well, they had a, an established religious system. They had the temple. They had people who knew the law. They had leaders. But they had no shepherds to care for their hearts. They had no shepherds that would bear their burdens with them. Those leaders just heaped more, more rules and regulations. You want to know God? Do this, do that, do the other thing. Listen to this teaching. Come to synagogue this often. Fast two times a week. Do. And if you do enough and you get it right enough, you'll know God. That was the party line. It didn't work for them. It just made the common person throw their hands up in frustration and walk away. I can't do it. I guess I'll just go back to being a fisherman. I guess I'll just go back and be a tax collector because at least then I'll live happy here. I'll have security here. And so many people today tell the same story. I just couldn't do it. I tried God and it didn't work. And that's their testimony. I tried. I really did. 
I would suggest to you that the law worked just fine for them. Go read Romans 6, 7, and 8. Stew in those chapters a little while. You see, the law was never intended to save. That was not its intention. The law was to show us our need. The law is perfect. The law is pure. It is a reflection of the character of God. And it shows us that we're not God. And no matter how hard we try, we can't be God. We will fail continually if we're trying to gain our righteousness through the law. So I would suggest that the people who walk away from God, what they're really walking away from is the law. And they're saying, I can't do that, so therefore i got to go try something else because this doesn't work. They haven't actually come to Christ his way. Back in the Garden of Eden, when Eve went and tried to gain the knowledge of God through that fruit, she tried to do it her own way. If you remember the story right, she saw it, she perceived it, and evaluated it through her senses. What she didn't realize was that her senses are limited. She didn't have full understanding. And so the promise was, you will know and, and, and have an understanding of good and evil, just like God. And she said, oh, that's great. Now, the thing that the serpent didn't bother to tell her was, you already are experiencing right now every bit of good there is. God has held nothing back from you. You have all good. So when she took that fruit, you know what she got? Evil. She got to experience the other half. God hadn't reserved anything good from her. He had protected her from evil. He had protected Adam from evil. But we stepped out of that protection and we do it every day of our life. We are no better than Adam and Eve. Don't go blaming them. We are just as bad. Thank the Lord that he came. He didn't give up on us. He came to fix our brokenness. He became like us, and he suffered the bitterness of death in our place. He was made perfect through his sufferings. That's such an interesting statement. Perfect, in this case, is the same word for complete or whole. He was not wrong or sinful in any way, but there was something lacking in Christ, even as divine being. He hadn't experienced our side of the tracks. And so when he came to earth and experienced humanity and all of its brokenness, and he put on a flesh like ours that is subject to limitations, he was made perfect, complete, to understand us completely. Now at the end of that, even walking through death and walking through rejection and walking through pain and walking through sorrow, now he could say, I understand, and it'd be an honest statement. If he had never tasted that, if he had never walked through it, he couldn't say, I get it. I understand. He just did it without sin. He never had a wrong thought or a wrong intention, wrong motive. He did it without sin. Not only that, he's not ashamed of us. This is Hebrews 2. He annihilated the accuser and the power of death and he set free captives. Because we were all in bondage, in sin. And so he set us free from that bondage so that we could be one with him. He became our king priest after the order of Melchizedek with no beginning and no end. And he calls us into that same priesthood. You see, the Torah spoke of one priesthood, and it was a, a wonderful priesthood at that time and in that space. But it was more like a band-aid or a management of symptoms. It wasn't a cure-all. It cured nothing. It just covered. In fact, the Day of Atonement, what does that mean? It means a covering. It's just a covering. It's not a fixing. It's a stopgap. Okay? The fixing came with the cross. 
It's the cross that gave us new life Amen. and new birth. Hallelujah. The Torah never gave it. It didn't even promise it. In the prophets it said that this was the great prophecy in Jeremiah and Isaiah said in different ways. But basically, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And this was talking future. Okay, they already had a temple and all that. This is the future. He says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, not like the one I made with your fathers. Pointing back to Moses. But a new covenant. And Jeremiah, he talks about this newness at length. He says, I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit. And then I'm going to put my spirit in you. And I'm going to cause you to be able to walk in my ways. It's new. It's not fixed. It's new. Because the first part was only a covering until the fullness of time. This fullness of time is a really important concept. It starts way back in Genesis. Where you start to see the fullness of time spoken about. And Abraham, we're studying Abraham right now. And Abraham was told in one of the parts where he was in, talking with God about this covenant promise. I'm going to give you land and sea. And he gives him a prophecy. What's going to happen to his people? He says, look, your people, your generations after you, they're going to end up being sold into slavery. They're going to stay there for 400 years. And then at the fullness of time, I will destroy those who are in the land and give you the land. See, it's always about the fullness of time because God's a righteous judge. And he waits. He waited. He forbear with humankind before he destroyed them off the face of the earth in Noah's time. He waited. He said, I will not bear with mankind forever. I will limit their days. It's always about the fullness of time. Even now we are waiting. For the revealing of the Son of Man to come the second time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's waiting until when? The fullness of time. It's not bad enough yet. Because he's a righteous judge. He will wait. And he doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He's always stretching his arms out to us. He spoke in the authority of God. Not his own. You know, Moses, he was a faithful servant, it says in Hebrews. A servant over God's household, but he's not like the son. The son, he cared for the household because that was his inheritance with tenderness and kindness and giving. In the same way that a shepherd loves his sheep, a hireling will run when the wolves come. But the shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. And so the son will spend everything for the household. Because that is his inheritance. And he has a vested interest in it. He has a vested interest in us. Christ came with a message according to Mark. He said, at last, this is, this is what he was preaching to people. This is Mark 2. At last, the fulfillment of the age has come. That is, the fulfillment of the tyrannical reign of sin. And the power of death. And Satan's control over the earth that started back in the Garden of Eden all the way through the establishment of Israel through the, the judges time period through the kings through the exile through the period the 400 year period of silence it now has stopped the end of this tyrannical reign has stopped and now the promise has come it is time for the revealing of the realm of God's kingdom. Turn your lives back to God. Put your trust in the hope-filled gospel. The good news that there's a better covenant, that our hearts are going to be made new and will no longer be broken. Well, what does that look like? That looks like knowing God. So many people want to know God. And they try in the wrong way to know God. It's the same trap that Eve fell into way back at the beginning. If I just learn more or find a better technique or go to enough Bible studies or spend enough time praying or fasting or doing something else that someone had suggested to me, then I'll know God. But it's not about mind games. It's about relationship. 
the best picture that God gives us of relationship is actually, I'll, I'll look at two of them. One is the marriage picture. And then one is the picture of Abraham and Lot. And I think, um, I think we'll start with Abraham and Lot. I'm just going to tell the story. This is found in Genesis uh, 15, 16, 17, 18. Go there if you want to read up on it. See if I'll tell you the truth. Abraham was driven by faith. Lot was driven by flesh. They both left. They both heard the word of God and left. Lot, however, went under the covering of Abram at the time because Abram was sort of like the patriarch. Haran had died, in her. and 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 so he he didn't have a father really to follow, so he followed under Abram. But they both left, and they went as vagabonds, if you will, into the surrounding area, and there were lots of journeys and stuff. But eventually, Lot grows up. In, in number and size, okay? And it's too much for him and Abram and the people who are living there to all dwell together without there being fighting among their workers. And so Abram says, pick a piece of land and go in the direction you want to go. I'll go the other way. And Lot has a Garden of Eden moment. He looks with his eyes, he perceives, and he says, hey, that looks like the Garden of God or like Egypt, which I always thought was a funny... Uh, comparison because Egypt has becomes the metaphor for slavery the metaphor for a good thing turned bad a promise of security in this world that becomes an enslavement that's what Egypt symbolizes and and Lot doesn't have the ability to distinguish between Egypt and the garden of God it looks the same to him so Lot moves off to the area of the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah in hopes of security and peace, and it looks good for him. And since Abram offered it, fine, I'll take it. Abram, on the other hand, says, okay. And God comes to him and says, you see, everything, I want you to look north, south, east, west, it's all yours, including that land that Lot just took. It's all yours. And he makes a promise. And Abram continues to live his separate life. He is truly a holy man of God. Holy just means separate. He was separate unto the Lord. And he stayed that way all of his life, wandering. In Hebrews, it says that he was seeking a city that is a security. That's what city stood for. That was not made with human hands. But one whose builder and architect was God. That's what Abraham was seeking. Well, Lot ends up in a city of this earth. In fact, not only does he end up in the city where it's comfortable and it appears secure, but he ends up there establishing a name for himself among the wicked. He's found by the two angels that come to go and check out Sodom and Gomorrah and see if they're really as bad as the reports have been. He's found in the gate. Well, the gate is the place of judgment. It's the place where all the legislation happens. It's where if you had to have something ratified, it had to be done at the gate. He was a leader of that wicked city. He makes a stand for righteousness and the people turn on him. They want to abuse the men who come to him under the shelter of his house. And he says, no, no, my brothers, don't do this. Here, take my virgin daughters instead. You like to have him as your dad? So they say, we'll do, is, we'll do worse to you. And they started to go after Lot. They turned on him. He thought this place was going to be a place of security. Maybe he had thought or deceived himself that he would have some sort of influence on these people. It didn't happen. Mixture never does, by the way. Whatever you think, oh, I'm going to I'm going to influence them for good. It never works out that way. That's why missionary dating never works. It just doesn't. You end up being pulled down. Peter says that righteous lot. Does that ever like make you want to scratch your head, righteous lot? Really? 
righteous Lot lived with his soul in torment. And I would suggest that a lot of saved people who are literally righteous because of Christ, because of his grace, live in torment because they're trying to find their comfort here. They're trying to find security here. They have deceived themselves into thinking that if I just live among the people here and I gain some sort of footing or ground or establishment, that I will be able to influence them. And they live in torment in their soul. Mm. Because there is two masters vying for them. Mm. They are not undivided of heart. Mm. And God has his mercy on Lot and he saves him twice by the hand of the godly Abram or Abraham, depending on when it was. He is saved. But look at the fruit of his life. He ends up alone. He didn't want to be alone. He wanted to be in a city. He ends up insecure, rejected by even that little town Zoar. They kick him out. He's rejected completely in a cave in an incestuous relationship with his daughters that produces two people groups, the Ammonites and the Moabites, who are a thorn in the flesh to the promise to Israel all the way through the rest of the scripture. Do you realize what this means? This means that this man who was righteous, the fruit of his body destroyed the very kingdom he should have been supporting. And so it is with us when we are flesh driven and we align ourselves with the world and we, we compromise ourselves. We actually destroy the very kingdom we're trying to promote. And then you have Abram, the faith driven man. He wasn't perfect. He was not perfect, but he loved the Lord. And he listened and he obeyed. And he had a relationship with the Lord. The Lord came to him progressively. If you read his life, it was first, go, leave all this stuff, and, and I will give you. And there was just a promise. It didn't even have a covenant assigned with it. It was just a promise. And he walked out, and his knowledge grew, and his covenant became more sure. It sort of reminds me of the verse where it says, work all the more diligently to make sure that you're calling an election or sure. Right? That's Paul. What does that mean? Well, I think we see it in Abram's life. He heard the call. He walked out in it. He obeyed God. And as he walked out his life, God started to establish that covenant in a more and more firm way. The first time the covenant was cut, that's when the animals were cut. You guys remember the animals? A heifer and a ram and a, and a goat split open and the two birds and then the smoking pot and the torch walked through it yeah. and, the, and the message was clear may it be to me that this happens to me if I don't make good on my promise to you Abram this is God speaking the second time he talks about a covenant he says I'm going to give you a sign so that not only you know I'm in covenant with you but everybody else I'm going to cut your flesh and circumcision became the sign of God's people throughout the ages. The cutting of the flesh. But he did another thing that people sort of gloss over a little bit. At the same time, he changed his name to Abraham at that time. Because his character had changed. And it wasn't just a, like a apples for apples kind of change. It was like apples for an orchard kind of change. It was... Abram, the exalted father, becoming Abraham, the father of many nations. It is the principle of life and life more abundant, which is what Christ said he came to give us. You see, it's all about Jesus. These are all pictures. These are all shadows and types of what he was going to do. It was to Abraham as an individual. It is now to all of us as a body. It is more abundant for sure. He changes the very character and nature of God. And then a couple of days later, we got the three, uh, the three visitors to Abram. If you can believe Jewish tradition, it was three days after the circumcision. Abram is hanging out looking to see if anybody is going to be coming his way. According to Jewish tradition, Abram was the most hospitable man ever. 
And he was always looking for someone to give to and to teach about God. Because he was always wanting to, to give what he had received. This was his heart. And so he's sitting there in the doorway of his tent during the cool of the day. He sees these visitors. He, he recognizes them and he says, hurry, kill the fatted calf. Go make tons of bread, tons of bread. If you do the math on that, it's like more loaves than you need for a whole army. It's huge. Bring it all. And, and, and he says, if you'll just wait a minute, I will come. And then he serves them. He stands by them while they eat. That's the form of a servant. He didn't think himself worthy to sit with them and eat with them and commune with them. No, he served them. Those visitors, and then it's identified that Yahweh was one of them. He says, they, they restate the promise. And so, it's, so the second witness principle is born right there in Genesis. That idea of there, things are established between two or three witnesses is right there. And he says, you're going to have a son. About this time next year, I'm going to come back. We don't have a record of what that was like. So what we can ascertain from that is that God was in a continual communion with Abram. This was not the first or the last time that he was walking with Abram. Abram sees the Lord on his way. They walk out in communion. And, and, and the three visitors have a conversation amongst themselves. Should we tell Abram what we're going to do? Should I tell it? Or shall, yes, excuse me, that's right. Yahweh says, should I tell Abram? Thank you for the correction. Um, should I tell Abram what we're going to do? And then he says, for I will surely make a good nation, uh, a good uh, a nation out of him. His progeny will surely take this land. And then he goes on to tell Abraham that he's getting ready to go down and to survey Sodom and Gomorrah for their destruction. Now, this was crazy when I thought about it. Abram is walking with God. They're back in the Garden of Eden. I mean, this, he has now a covenant. He has a relationship with God that is firm and secure. And that brings him right into relationship with God. And that relationship with God teaches him the heart of God. And he has wisdom from God. And then he starts to act like God because God changed his name. And so what does he do? He begins to plead for the souls in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not the soul of Lot. He already, he already took care of Lot the previous time, you know, with the kings and all that and tar pits. Okay, but this, no, this was for Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked of the land. And he says, oh Lord, don't destroy them. He had the heart of God there. God. Not only did he have the heart of God, which is a merciful heart and a long-suffering heart. And he was expressing that. But he did something else. He had something else. He didn't even care about himself. You see, even Yahweh made mention that we are going to give him this land. In his own best interest, it would have been like, yeah, burn him up. A couple of people groups that I won't have to deal with. Or my progeny won't have to deal with later on. You realize that by him saying, no, don't kill them, don't destroy them off the face of the earth, he was actually taking a, a hit himself. Mm. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? Amen. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yes, Lord. You see, he was walking in the pathway of God. Why? Because he had learned of God. He knew God because he walked with God. Amen. He was a man of faith. Jesus, thank you. That's why God said, you ought to be children of Abraham. And when the Pharisees, the most religious people in the world, dared to look the Son of God in the face and say, we are after our father Abraham. He said, no, you aren't. You are after your father, the devil. Whoa. That was cold water on their face. You don't know Abraham, he said. You don't have a clue. Because you don't walk with God. You see, knowledge of the scripture has nothing to do with knowing God. Knowledge of the scripture has to do with your brain and the ability to put information in there and hold it and retrieve it. You could memorize the Bible and not know God. Mm. 
So how do you know God? That's the million dollar question. If you can't get there by memorizing scripture or studying church history or studying the traditions of Judaism or the first century church or looking at archaeology or exploring the symbolism between the New Testament and the Old Testament, how that all works. If you can't get there that way, how do you get there? And that brings to the second picture. God says that Jesus desired a bride. And so the picture of our intimacy with Christ, our knowing Christ, is one of a marriage relationship. Which is why Satan has worked so hard to destroy our marriages. Mm -hmm. Because he wants to distort that image. Mm. So that we won't even know what that looks like in a healthy way. But I think there's still enough that we can resonate with to see what it's like to know God. When you first find someone that you want to marry, it's all about them. We call it puppy love. You love it. You are so excited. And everybody gets sick hearing you talk about <laughs> that person whom you worship and adore. They can't do wrong. Oh, he's so wonderful. <laughs> he just gives me so much pleasure. <laughs> gifts and chocolates. And you know what he did? He called me and talked to me for four hours last night. He thought he had to work in the morning. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, and it's it's just, it's gooey. And, and all your friends, they suffer along with you. <laughs> because that's the way it is. That's the way love is. We worship and adore the things we love. And for those of you who haven't had this pleasure of having a human relationship, we do it with other things too. Whatever it is that captures our hearts. And, and so it becomes natural. Nobody has to say, you know, you need to really talk about this love interest that you have. Nobody has to, like, prod you with that. If you really love that person, it just comes out, you know. You can't help yourself. You don't even realize you're talking about him again. Right? Worship. And the other thing that is characterized during this first stage is Thanksgiving. Man. I can remember when Erez, after six months of dating, he brought me this little bag and it had just a couple little things in it to celebrate our six months of knowing each other, I think is what it was. Six months of knowing each other. And it had a little frog in it that still sits on my bed. And it has, uh, it had some candies in it and stuff and this really sappy card. And I cried. And for the next week and a half, all of my friends, co-workers and people I didn't know had to endure me telling them about this gift. Because I was so thankful that he had thought of me. And so it is, for, particularly for those who have been saved out of the pit. So it is with us. We go, oh my goodness, God loves me. Did you see that rainbow outside? Did you see the snow and the sun and the way it was hitting through the, the crystals and the snow? It's like diamonds. He put them there for me. I love them. And we should. That's a proper response, by the way. He loves me. I heard this song. I woke up and I was just overwhelmed with his goodness and his grace to me. Does God overwhelm you? Hallelujah. Does his love teach you and, and, and just reach you to the center of your core? Do you just sometimes weep at the thought of how good he is? Is your Ooh. love alive? Or has it done what so many married people have experienced? Has it, has it started to get cold? Has it gotten stale? Is it in a dry spot? My mom used to say, well, sometimes we go through dry spots. I don't think we've gone through a dry spot. I don't ever want to go through a dry spot. Keep your love alive. Thank the Lord. I think that's why the Bible says to give thanks in 
circumstance. Amen. Because it stokes the fire of love in your heart. Oh, Jesus, be praised. Mm. Hallelujah. Rejoice in every circumstance. Amen. Not just the good ones, the bad ones, the in-between ones, the boring ones, the exciting ones, and everything. Everything. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. And again, I say rejoice. Worship. Worship isn't about thank you for this, thank you for that. Thank yous are great for blessings. And we're supposed to thank even when it's not a perceived blessing because God promises that everything that comes into your life will work out for good. So it may be a hidden blessing, but it is a blessing nonetheless. My brain tumor is a hidden blessing. The children, when they disobey, is a hidden blessing for me. It's teaching me. It's refining me. It's growing me. When I have an argument with Eris, it's a hidden blessing. It's good for me. Well, whatever you want to call it. All right? So, in reality, if we could see rightly from God's perspective, it's all a blessing. Because he only desires good for us. But... The worship is focused on not what he's done or is doing, but on who he is. Amen. That's on his very character and nature. That is the young lady who is extolling the virtues of her beloved. It's Song of Solomon. Amen. It is worship. Those two things are more prevalent at the beginning of your relationship. Though we ought to keep them alive through our entire relationship because it makes for a much happier experience. It really does. The second two are where the maturing happened though. Mitchell and Megan just got married. Hallelujah. Yay. Praise the Lord. And you guys, I hope you ride out those first Blushes of love for a long time. But sooner or later, hardship is going to happen. And you guys are going to walk through it. And that hardship will be a blessing. Thank God for it. As soon as it happens, I hope you remember and you say, Thank you, God, for that loss of job. Hallelujah for that sickness. Because it's going to be what drives the roots deep. Woo. Glory, Jesus. It is the difficulty that drives the roots deep. We Glory are in winter right now. And everything looks dead. Except for maybe the green trees there. The ever, evergreens <laughs> that I'm pointing to. The ones out there look dead. Why? What happens during that time period when the whole earth is covered in this blanket of insulating snow? The roots are driven deep. And with every storm that comes through here and blows across our little prairie land and makes those trees then like almost horizontal, it drives the roots deep and makes them hardy so that they can withstand anything. And so it is in our married life. It is the poorer part or for richer or poor. It's the sickness part of in sickness and health. That's the part that makes you mature. It's not the easy times. Amen. And with the Lord, these, these difficult times will come in our relationship as well. And so how do you know God? But by going through the difficult times. And when that happens, instead of trying to navigate those difficult times in our old way, our knee-jerk reaction of coping according to the world systems, we search the word of God for a promise. We say, oh God, you've got to give me something that I can hang my hat on for this time and space. And he always will. Maybe it's the word, I am the sufficient one. I am your rock and your fortress. I am your salvation. I am your healer. Whatever it is. He'll give you a word that's for you as you come to him with your questions and your hurts and your difficulties. And he'll speak that into your life. And you hold on to that. And you refuse to disengage. You see, as people, we just want to disengage from the pain. I don't want to feel pain. I want comfort. So I'll take the pill for my depression or anxiety. I just want to feel better. Or I'll take... The drink to forget. 
Or I'll just pretend it's okay and put a happy face on and hope nobody asks really what's going on in my heart or in my life or in my relationships. I don't want to talk. I just won't answer because if I don't say it, it doesn't exist. It's a lie, folks. Stop lying to yourself. It exists. Your pain exists. We live in a broken world. Let God heal you. Ask him to speak into your life truth. Stop lying. You know, Christians are the best liars in the world. We are. We lie. We lie to everyone, including ourselves. We go, I'm a Christian, so it's all okay. Oh, I'm blessed. No, you aren't. Your life sucks. It does. We deal with all kinds of things. All the brokenness of the world that everybody else deals with. And Satan hates us too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are pursued by the evil one. But praise the Lord. God is greater. He has overcome the evil one of this world. Hallelujah. And we can stand. Jesus be praised. But we don't have to lie about it when things are going wrong. So when someone says, hey, how are you doing? You don't have to say, I'm fine. And put a smile on your face. You're not fine. Don't be fine. You can't let God heal you if you're lying to yourself. Mm. Mm. So there's two areas that are, are really the ones that mature us. One mm. is a commitment to follow. Okay? When Jesus was walking around on the earth, people recognized he was something special. And so people would say, hey, I want to follow you. And he says, okay, you got to come be my disciple. You have to take up your cross and follow me if you want to be my disciple. Some people came up to him and said, hey, I want to follow you. He goes, um, you know, foxes, they got holes. And there's dens for certain animals, but I don't even have a place to lay my head. Are you sure you want to follow me? Or let me just take care of my earthly things here, and then I'll come follow you. No, nope, doesn't work that way. You follow me on my terms, not on your terms. This is my paraphrase. You see, Jesus didn't make it easy for anyone to follow. He was honest with them. Following Christ was not Christ is not just a doorway. I mean, he is the door. That's he said that about himself. He's also the gate. That's another thing he said, which means that there's judgment. And the judgment falls on him at the gate. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. But he's also the way. Woo! Amen. And in Hebrew, the the idea of the way, the derech, is a pathway for your life to be lived out. He is the way. I am so tired of the marginalization of Christ. I had a lady sit in my living room and say, you know, I think you're talking about Jesus too much. I said, well, what else is there to talk about? I mean, he is God in flesh. He's the one that God himself said, I, I delight in him. I put his name higher than every other name. Every foot, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. So why don't we talk about him? Right. Why is it that in our churches today, of any denomination, I'm not picking on any denomination, all of them do it. People won't hardly mention the name of Jesus except at the end of their prayers. Why? Is there no more power in the blood? Woo! Doesn't his sacrifice, isn't that what makes us clean? Glory to God. Isn't he the one who gives us the Holy Spirit? Isn't it Christ in you? I challenge you. Read Ephesians. How many times does it say in Christ? Christ in you. If it isn't a big deal, then why is it such a big deal in Paul's writings? Why is it such a big deal in Acts? Why is it such a big deal in Revelation? Glory to God. And why is it that Jesus said, if you do not speak forth my name, if you don't confess me in front of other people, I will not confess you before my father. Woo! How dare we not speak his name? Like he's some sort of blot to our religiosity. And I'm sick of it. It is Satan who has de deceived people 
people and marginalize Christ because he knows their power. Yeah. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And he has deceived a whole group of people into just that's that's politically not correct. Right. That's that's not correct. I, I can't say that I might offend someone. Offend them! Glory! Amen. Pick a side. Mm-hmm. Pick a side. But if you want to follow the word of God, you're going to have to read honestly the accounts of Christ and what he calls for and the explanations that are found in the New Testament for why it was important. And if you want a relationship with God, it's all about Christ because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. And the life way that means continual, not a doorway that you walk through and you're through it and you're done. No, a way, a pathway every day of your life will be in Christ. The truth, the only thing that's reliable, there is no truth today. We can all be pilots saying, What's truth? You can't tell anymore. Read the newspaper. Is that truth? (laughs) Who knows? I could make a really nice blog, put pretty pictures on it, put it up there and say that, you know, Santa Claus is going to dress in pink and purple tomorrow. It could look real. I could even doctor some pictures and stuff. And it wouldn't be any more true than the stuff that's out there right now. It's all false. We don't know what's false, what's not. Everybody claims truth and nobody knows what it is. Except for Jesus. He says, I am the truth. Glory. And I am the life. And very importantly, no one comes to the Father except by me. I had other people come and sit and they talk and you go, I just want to know the Father. I want to know Abba God. And that's a good thing. Jesus says, I'm the way. You want to know the Father? You know me. I am the exact representation of God the Father to you. I am God the Father to you. In fact, Isaiah prophesied it. And that long litany of means he's the Prince of Peace and he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and all that. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting what? Father. Father. His name is the Father. He wasn't making it up in the New Testament. He was repeating it from the old. Follow him. When you follow him, that means you submit to him like Abraham did. You leave your house, your kindred, your tribe, the things you love, the things that make sense to you. And you head out not knowing where you're going. Glory. You follow him. And when he tells you to go, you go. And when he tells you to stay, you stay. And when he tells you to do something, you do it. And when he tells you to stop doing it, you stop right. doing it. And you submit to his following. Just like a wife is to submit to her husband. It's an imperfect picture because our husbands aren't perfect. (laughs) But it is a picture. And it is beautiful in God's sight when we will submit to him. The second thing we are to do is to become one. Remember back when Eve was presented to Adam and he took her as his wife. There's a little explanatory note in there. That God puts in. He says, and the two shall become one One. flesh. This is a picture of what God wanted with us. That's why Jesus came. Was so that we could have Christ in us. Or shall we say, we could be one flesh. That's the picture. Oneness is not about a physical connection. Anybody who's married can tell you that oneness is not about sex. Oneness is about sharing the same heart, the same mind, the same focus, the same goals. And people are mostly dissatisfied in their marriages, not because of the physical part of their relationship. It will spill out into that if there is dysfunction in other areas. But there are many people who have active physical relationships, but their hearts remain separated from each other and they are dissatisfied in their relationships. Or they don't have the same vision. And so he's got her, his stuff, she's got her stuff, and they live separate lives except for in the bedroom. And it's dissatisfying. Have mercy, Jesus. If we try to do that spiritually, we too will be dissatisfied. 
So that brings us back to our opening question. What's your peace? Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied? Has he become your El Shaddai? Your sufficient one? Because he's satisfying every need that you have in your soul, in your mind, in your body, in your spirit. Has he filled that area? Have you become one flesh with him? I understand it's moving from glory to glory. We are, none of us are complete. We are all in an upward trend. But every time you say no to yourself and you say yes to God, you become more and more his. Amen. You gain the mind of Christ. That's why Paul says it. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Amen. Not only are you supposed to give a nod to him, you are supposed to become like him to the point when you are in the shoes of Abraham, our forefather of faith, interceding for the wicked cities to your own hurt. Because you have the heart of God too. And you know what is on his heart and what's breaking his heart and it breaks yours and you live in anguish and joy at the same time it is a paradox i can't explain it to you how you can weep and be happy at the same time but you can jesus was called a man of sorrows i don't think he walked around droopy faced but he understood the father's heart and the burden and when you walk with God, you will understand his burden. You will take that on just as a bride takes on the vision of her husband and walks forward to make that happen because she's his helpmate. We are Christ's helpmate mm -hmm. created for him. The body of Christ who are his hands and feet on this earth right now in this time in this place. Yes. And because he is within us, we are moving in one flesh with him can you even get your head around that the divine lives within you mm. that's what we believe that's what the bible teaches i hope it's an encouragement this is how you mature in christ and as you learn and you grow it will become more and more firm in you as you walk along the way, just as with Abraham, the covenant was progressively revealed to him. It didn't happen at one moment. It was progressive. And so it is with us. Mitchell and Maggie, when you sign that document saying, I'm married before the, the Lord and before the government, you got married, but you aren't stopping there, hopefully. You're going to take it until one of you goes to be with the Lord or both of you. And you will walk that marriage out learning day after day after day how to become more and more one flesh. It's progressive. So it's a moment and a lifetime. May it be for us that we never grow weary in doing good. We never stop fanning the flames of love in our hearts through worship, through thanksgiving, through constant submission, through seeking that oneness. And when you do that, you will be satisfied. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world around you. When someone asks you, Mashlumcha, you'll say, I'm wonderful. My peace is full. My satisfaction is complete. I have everything I need. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord that you have extended yourself to us and you have invited us to become one with you. What a high privilege. We don't deserve it, Lord, but you do it anyway. And you are so good. You are the ever giving Lord and you bear long with our weaknesses and you continue to call out to us, Lord, I pray that we would not turn a deaf ear, mm. that we would not be like those Israelites who took the salvation of you from Egypt but because of their unbelief and their wickedness in their heart, their sin in their heart, they didn't possess their inheritance. Lord, may we not wander all of the days of our life in a wilderness. Amen. Oh, Lord, may we enter in. Give us the faith of Joshua and of Caleb to enter in and conquer the land with you. Oh, Father, I praise your name. Mm. For everything necessary pertaining to godliness you have given us through Jesus Christ, your son. Mm. Hallelujah. I praise your name.
Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that your anointing would fall upon these people. You would just make these words real, that they would take them and they would live in them and they would change their lives, change my life, take me to the next place, Lord, as we continue to learn and to walk in your ways. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for community. Thank you for family. Thank you for the days of rest. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, which is always with us. Hallelujah. I bless your name. In Jesus' name, for your glory. Amen. 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 Folks, uh, I shared with Brother Adam. I said first, 2 Corinthians 4. It's actually 2 Corinthians 3. This is the word of the Lord that... I know the Lord has been tugging on people's hearts. I know He has. He's been tugging on mine. He's been ripping me apart. Therefore, this is 2 Corinthians 3 verse 12. Having such a hope, we use great boldness. We are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not stare at the end of what was fading away, but their minds were closed or thoughts were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, in the King James, it could be disposition, testament, Let's put it another way. What, what Leanne said, the law, flesh, how to do it better, different. Guys, it's the same old trick, same old technique. There's nothing different. The same veil remains. It is not lifted because it is set aside or put away only in Christ. Even to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, now this is Jesus. The veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Jesus now. And where the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. And the Lord gave me the word about 2 Timothy 3 when Paul warns Timothy in the last days. In the church, there will people who have uh, they will be uh, holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Folks, is the transformation power of Jesus Christ living in you? Is Jesus the center of your thoughts? Is he the center of your life? Is he the center of your being? Is every reading, every doing, not just in religious stuff, not just in spiritual stuff, in your work, in your play, in your cooking, in your caring of the kids, is the gospel the center thing of your being? If it's not, you have a veil on your eyes and you will not see rightly. You will not see to undo the pain in your life. You will not see to break free. You will not have freedom and you will be in bondage. And the testimony of Christ in you may be hindered because he is not the center of your life. David Wilkerson says this in his message of the Antichrist. He says, if 90% of the throne of your heart is Jesus Christ, but 10% is the Antichrist. You have the Antichrist in you. The spirit of the Antichrist. Excuse me. Spirit of the Antichrist. You have all of Jesus Christ, or you have none of him. So that's an altar call. God has been tugging on your heart. And then this is the word of the Lord. If, if, if you're saying, you know, Erez, Leanne, what you guys are talking about is like really punching me. But I don't know how to get from here to there. Something is tugging me. I know what you're saying is right. My head's saying this doesn't make sense. But I know in me, I, I can't run away. It's killing me. It's burning me. It's making me sick in my stomach. Come. Guys, come and, 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 and the Lord, and, and surrender. That's the call. There's, there's, there's stuff in my head. Stuff from my past. Stuff I can't let go. I don't even know how it got there. But I know this is right. I don't have the words for it, but this is right. Guys, come. We'll pray for you and receive healing from Jesus. And if anyone is sick, we want to pray for you too. Father in heaven, thank you for our time, your time. Thank you for the words of life you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.